good morning, Hillcrest Bible Church. It's so good to be with you again, wherever you are. And uh, my name is Fred Schmidt, one of the pastors here at Hillcrest. And I uh, just wanted to encourage you this morning and, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are looking forward to continuing our process towards regathering together on Sunday mornings for those who are comfortable with that, but also working hard to continue uh, offering a high quality service over video each week for those of you who would uh, for a time prefer to uh, worship at home. So just a little bit again on what we have planned as we begin this process of regathering together. Uh, we've got a special event coming up. Uh, we're calling it Service on the Lawn and uh, we're going to be gathering on July 27th. That's a Monday evening and aug also August 3rd, the next Monday. Uh, for a special time of, of a service with some time of, of music and singing and stories. And we encourage you to come along, bring something to eat. We'll have everybody in designated places on the grass at Hillcrest. Uh, so we're all socially distanced from one another. And uh, those will be a great time. Encourage you in the email you got today uh, in your e-news to go ahead and sign up for one of those two dates. So we have a good idea of how many are planning to come. After that, on uh, August 15th, we're looking forward to Camp Fairwood for the day. Uh, Camp Fairwood is something we've done for many, many years around here at Hillcrest, and it's going to look a lot different this year, but we're excited to still get up there for the day and uh, get to enjoy one another in that beautiful setting. Uh, in your e-news this coming Wednesday, Lord willing, we'll have uh, a lot of detail in there and a place for you to register for meals and the different activities that you'd want to partake in. Uh, up at Camp Fairwood. So watch for that. And, uh, and again, uh, please pay attention to all the details that you'll find there as some things have changed significantly uh, from previous years. And then of course, after that, uh, we're looking forward to Sunday, August 23rd. That is the day that we have in mind that we will uh, be able to regather in person at Hillcrest uh, for some beautiful worship and fellowship. Uh, and again, things will look will look different, but uh, we're excited to bring people together. And of course, we're remembering our value to remain flexible as uh, things continue to, to change over time around uh, this, uh, this COVID that we're dealing with. So, uh, so that's really exciting. And as we're excited about regathering together, uh, I also want to share with you some news about one of our own who we are actually sending out into full-time ministry. So uh, Zach Willie, want to introduce you to uh, anyone at Hillcrest who doesn't know who you are yet. And I'd love it if you would share with us a little bit about uh, your journey at Hillcrest, how God has called you into full-time ministry, and tell us a little bit about your plans this fall. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Fred. Um, yeah, so like Fred was saying, my name is Zach Willie. Um, my family and I have been attending Hillcrest for about 10 years now. We came in the fall of 09, but um, throughout my time in Hillcrest, was involved with DV8, if any of you remember that. And um, yeah, I got saved at Districts when I was in seventh grade. Um, yeah, I went to college at UW Madison, and um, throughout my time there, got involved with a ministry group called Navigators. And um, throughout my time in the Navigators, really was strengthened and um, grew in my faith of, of the Lord and, and my boldness in sharing the gospel. And um, around my junior year, really felt a calling to go into full-time ministry. Felt like the Lord was leading me in that direction, and, um, and then that's what I wanted to do. Um, so here I am, just graduated, and um, I'll be going up to Duluth this fall um, to be working for the Navigators in, in full-time collegiate ministry. Um, so throughout my time up there, my heart is really going to be um, for freshman students. And just in myself, I, I got to see how influential having spiritual mentors were uh, my freshman year when I was so indecisive and unknowing of college, of, of what to do next, of my own faith, and um, just getting to see other freshmen grow and be strengthened um, is really where my heart is for. Um, so that's what I'll be doing this next year, and um, yeah. That, that's really cool, Zach, and, and I love how, uh, you know, you've been listening to God as you've grown in your faith in Him uh, over these last several years. And in fact, uh, knowing a, a significant uh, time in your life as a freshman in college, uh, you're, you're being pulled into that too, to really minister to uh, these, these guys and gals as they try to figure out life on their own. So what a great place to be. And uh, 
you know, on behalf of the All Nations team, we, we just love the fact that we can invite you in as an All Nations partner. And uh, I would like to commission you as such and pray for you as we send you out uh, to, to the nations, to, to University of Minnesota Duluth and uh, to your ministry there. So uh, friends and family uh, of Hillcrest, if you would uh, pray with me as we send uh, Zach out. Let, let's pray together. Oh, our Father, we thank you for the grace that you have shown in Zach's life, that you have called him from death to life and into this wonderful personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for stirring his heart to reach people with the gospel, uh, for stirring his heart to reach these young men and women who are away from home for the first time, up at college, and so I ask that you bless him as he continues to uh, raise his support to, to go. I pray that you bless him as he prepares to uh, start this, this new ministry in his life. And I ask that you would bless him uh, this fall, uh, especially with some of the unknowns about what fall campus life will look like. Pray that you would open doors that he would never have imagined that he can uh, walk through and uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ with others around him. So Father, we, we send Zach out, place him in your hands, and ask you to use him in a mighty way uh, to, to reach others with this great news. And we commission him and pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank Zach. You. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name.
Thank you, worship team, for preparing our hearts to hear God's word. Uh, my name is Brian Stefile. I'm one of the elders here at Hillcrest, and this is my wife, Nicole. Uh, thank you for joining us this week. Uh, this week, we are continuing our sermon series on tensions uh, found in the Bible. Uh, we often find ourselves wrestling with concepts uh, found in the Bible or about God that our finite minds have trouble grasping. Uh, I really appreciated the sermon series uh, for several reasons. First, I really enjoy going deep into God's word uh, and being amazed uh, and reminded of how much we fully don't understand about uh, God. We serve an infinite God uh, and all of eternity won't be enough time to fully understand him. Uh, second, I appreciate not just the academic side of uh, going deep uh, and investigating these tensions, but I appreciate the applications of how to live uh, this out in our everyday lives. Uh, today we are looking at how a holy, perfect, and righteous God who hates sin and despises sin can draw us, unrighteous sinners, to him. Uh, our sin is abhorrent to God, yet he loves us and desires us to draw near to him. Uh, there's a tension there that is, is really uh, tough to grasp. Um, we can follow Christ's lead and navigate in a world that is so often hostile to Christians uh, and God's design uh, for humanity. So today we're going to open up to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Uh, so Nicole, if you will read that for us. Sure. This is the parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. 
I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, uh, thank you so much for your word uh, and the limitless of, limitlessness of who you are. We pray for wisdom and open hearts to understand how to navigate these tensions that we read about. Uh, please give us guidance in navigating in a world that all too often is hostile uh, to you. Help us glorify you, uphold your righteousness, and still love on people even when they want nothing to do with you. In your name, amen. amen. Hey, thank you, Brian and Nicole, for that introduction uh, about this series. Just like Brian said, uh, this is uh, a series on the, the tensions that exist. Uh, back in California at the church I was at, inevitable tensions was one of the values, in it, and it penetrated, saturated my heart. Uh, that sometimes we could be bored with who God is, but instead, just like Brian said, we want to be overwhelmed with the complexity and the enormity of who he is, and, and that should produce wonder, awe, excitement at who he is, and, and so excited to continue on. But before we get there, I, I just wanted to say two things that have brought me joy uh, and thankfulness this week. Uh, one, uh, thank you for your generosity. We just finished our fiscal year, and though we were 6K under budget or under, under giving for the budgeted year, uh, we were above uh, due to uh, underspending. And so I just wanted to say thank you for your generosity this past year. Thank you for, for giving towards the mission of Hillcrest and uh, helping people uh, hear from God through his word and encounter him, not just as, as being thumped through the Bible, but actually being saturated to experience him through his word. So thank you this year, this, uh, this year for your generosity. And this year makes one year for, for Casey and I and my family here. And just wanted to extend um, from our family just a deep thankfulness uh, we had uh, this past year. Uh, not the year we anticipated, probably not the one you anticipated either. Uh, but we are so thankful for the love you guys have showered us with. Um, your, 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 uh, your graciousness as I learned what it meant to use a snowblower this year. And, uh, and just the love that you've poured out to my family and, and to my wife and to myself. So just wanted to say thank you for, uh, for who Hillcrest is uh, and has been to our family. If you're new with us, uh, we are so glad you're joining. Uh, just like Brian said and I said, we are in this series of tensions. And we're pressing into one today that I think is unique um, and, and incredibly practical in its, in its expression because it feels like Jesus says, love your enemies. In Matthew 5, to 45, he says this, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that they may, son, may, so that they may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and unjust. And when we hear that, love your enemies, your mind might have gone to, yeah, yeah, I do have enemies, David, and it's hard to love them, but, but I understand that Jesus says, love your enemies, so I will. I, I don't actually think that's what Jesus intends here. Instead, when we become followers of Jesus, we no longer have enemies. Instead, we want everyone to experience the love of Jesus. I think what he means when he says love your enemies is actually those who consider you their enemy. He's actually saying love those who may be opposed to you. And it just feels interesting. I don't know if you can relate to, to this, but it feels like in our world right now, how do I love people that perceive me as being hateful towards them. That if I somehow disagree with someone's thinking or position on life, that, that they've now separated uh, me and put me in a category that would, would perceive me as being hateful towards them. That, that I feel like I'm forced to choose. I either, I either am this or am this. And, and the tension we're going to wrestle with today is how do we stand for God's glory and yet simultaneously move towards and love those that don't share that same vantage point? 
What does it look like to, to love my enemies when I'm perceived as, as uh, not being loving and, and potentially being misinterpreted in my actions? So uh, I want to try and accomplish that in three ways today. Uh, the three ideas that I, that I want to try and walk us through. I want to recognize the hurt, the brokenness, and the challenges that exist in the world that we find ourselves in. But I also want to spend time looking and recognizing the depth of our own brokenness and the words that actually changed our lives. And then third, I want to spend some time maybe in in that practical nature of, so what does it mean to live and go as spirit-filled missionaries in our world today? Uh, To actually happily make friends with sinners. So pray with me as we, as we get into the text this morning. God, you're so good. Thank you for who you are, what you're doing in our lives. Uh, with, with the nature of the world we find ourselves in today, God, continue to give us wisdom, give us clarity on how to move and breathe and live and act in a world that, that sometimes seems so contrary to, to your, your design and your heart. So may we be conduits of your grace every single day and give us confidence a little bit more today on what that might look like. To live in this tension of standing for your righteousness, Jesus, and yet simultaneously loving those who who don't live in light of that reality. Thank you, Jesus. Always for your glory we pray. Amen. Amen. So first, just want to press into this reality to see the hurt and the brokenness and the challenges that exist all around us. Um, you, you may or may not recognize that there feels like there's a little bit of political aggression that exists in our community. Uh, I mean, it, you could find yourself cheering for our president to hold his rally in Tulsa, or you could be concerned on why he's doing that but cheering for the freedom to protest some of the injustices that take place. Uh, you, you might find yourself, it seems like those two issues are on either side of the political spectrum. It, do we wear a mask or do we not wear a mask? That, that if I don't wear a mask, am I perceived as somehow being threatening towards someone else? And if I do wear a mask, am I somehow giving in to some kind of potential perception that this isn't as... As, uh, as real of an issue. And, and we politicize the, the essence of even wearing a mask. You might find yourself seeing this political aggression in our landscape. Uh, racial hostility. Uh, it, it feels like, uh, if you've never heard her name, I read a story recently this week in a book called um, Talking with Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell, and he opens up with a story about Sandra Bland. If you haven't heard her story, I'd recommend just go read it, uh, wrestle with it. Uh, George Floyd and, and some of the, some of the uh, resulting circumstances. Uh, just recently, uh, a, a, a talk show host, if we can call him that, Nick Cannon, uh, shared, was accused of sharing uh, an anti-perspective uh, towards a certain race, and he was released from his position, uh, stirring up even more controversy. Again, just, just even the essence of, of the distinction where, where it feels like it's been politicized, where, where I care deeply for Black Lives Matter, and yet if I use those words, there's a movement that, that we might not agree with, this racial hostility that exists. Uh, I want to recognize the hurt and the brokenness and the challenges that exist all around us. Racial hostility, this has kind of been around for a long time, even if we look back in the first century and the issues with Samaritans. This racial hostility, it feels like, has been around for a long time, and and people tend to identify or, or, or divide based upon ethnicity. Uh, depreciating sexual values. Um, uh, I don't consider, I mean, I, I still feel like I'm a young man. I'm 36 years old. But I remember in 2008, 2009, uh, about the legalization of homosexual marriage and, and what that could end up doing to our, uh, to our cultural climate. Um, we can see now 
10, 11, 12 years later, what that continues to take shape and form as. Just recently, last month in June, uh, the Supreme Court extends LGBT anti-discrimination protections by making a ruling on the definition of what sex means. And they included gender identity in that definition. Uh, and so you just wonder where, where our world is continuing to move towards in this depreciating view of sexual values. I found myself watching a show on Netflix the other night, and I thought I had tapped into a crime drama, and all of a sudden I found myself caught up in, in these couples experiencing uh, infidelity towards each other, and I thought, what in the world did I just get myself into? Right? It, it feels like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, if you wanted to pursue any type of pornography, you'd have to find it on a magazine. Now you can just open up your phone and find any image at any time you want. There's a depreciating sexual values in our culture. We want to recognize the challenges that exist when we attempt to stand for God's glory and yet love those that oppose that perspective. Uh, and, and, and here's one. It doesn't even feel like it's on the menu anymore. It doesn't even feel like it's, it's one that, that holds as much weight. Rather, it feels like if you, if you take a stand for this issue, uh, you're, you're neglecting the other issues that are at play in our world. The sanctity of life still is very near and dear to my heart. And, and not, just, not just at conception, but for the continuation of the sanctity of life. And, and yet, it doesn't even feel, for, you, for, for those of you that maybe have been, uh, maybe for you, you remember Roe versus Wade, and, and you were around during that time, and you've seen uh, just where our, our country continues to go. I want to recognize the hurt and the brokenness and the challenges that exist when we desire to love our enemies. But I hope you hear in all this, what an opportunity! What an opportunity that is presented to us to actually stand for God's glory and love our enemies and say there's something better, namely life with Jesus. But it doesn't mean it's not going to be challenging. And so we recognize just the world and the climate we live in, and these are just a few of the issues. But I hope there's also a recognition as we move and recognize what exists around us, a depth of our own brokenness and the words that changed our lives. So, so it feels like in Tim Keller's book, The Prodigal God, he speaks of two ways we attempt to find fulfillment in this life. One comes from self-discovery. That on one end of where some people pursue fulfillment and significance in this life, it comes from self-discovery. And, and they look at another perspective, and here's their accusation. The bigoted people, the bigoted people, the people that say they have, we have the truth, are the problem with the world, and the progressive people are the solution. Feels like there's two ways people try and find significance in this life. One is through self-discovery the freedom to, to, to express and to choose. And they look at moralistic people and they say, the bigoted people, the people that say they have, we have the truth, they are the problem with the world and progressive people are the solution. On the other side, here's what Jesus seems to say to the other people. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Whenever Jesus got after people who were trying to find significance in this life, it didn't appear he went after those who found themselves more on the self-discovery side. Instead, the ones that Jesus often got after were those that held a moralistic perspective on finding significance and fulfillment in this life. It feels like those that are trying to find significance and fulfillment in that moralistic conformity say this, to those on the self-discovery side. The immoral people, the people who do their own thing, they are the problem with this world, and the moral people are the solution. And yet in this parable in Luke 15, Jesus doesn't seem to get after the self-discovery people. 
he gets after the moralistic people. And he offers a third alternative to actually where we ought to be finding significance and fulfillment. Here's what Jesus offers. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And and my mind can't help but go and ask the question, what was it about the words Jesus was saying? What was it about the way he was saying it that those others were drawn in to hear from him and those who were holding a moralistic view of life were opposed to him? What what was it that he was, was saying? And here's my best attempt to try and get a sense of what Jesus is offering. Here's what it feels like. Here's what it feels like God's plan for lasting significance and fulfillment is. I think he's wired us all to want to seek that fulfillment and significance and purpose. He's wired us all in the self-discovery people are trying to find it in one way and the moralistic people are trying to find it in another way, but he's wired us all to long to seek for that significance. But that meaning, most lasting happiness and significance is only found in the person of Jesus. And it's only found in him. How abstract of a concept is that? But it's only found in the person of Jesus. Our identity no longer is wrapped up in our gender identity, our sex, our race, our political affiliation. Our identity begins to be wrapped up in the person of Jesus. And all people are pursuing that. They're all pursuing their significance and fulfillment somewhere. But it feels like they're looking in the wrong places. They're finding their identity in their political affiliation. They're finding their identity in their sex or gender identity. They're finding their identity in their ethnicity and race. And Jesus speaks into that and he says, I want you to find your significance and fulfillment in me. These were the words that I think I hear Jesus offering to the moralist who's trying to find their significance and following the rules and accusing those who appear to be contrary to the rules, Jesus says, stop finding your security in the rules. To those that are finding their discovery of themselves and finding their identity in how they identify in their sexual preferences, Jesus says, find your identity in me. And those that have found our identity in Jesus, we are actually called to help others find their identity in him. And there's a question that often comes up in my heart and my mind because I start to make judgments and I say, but, but Jesus, this guy, does he, is he able to be ex- ex- accepted too? And we could sometimes ask this question, can someone who is blank be a Christian? David, David, can someone who is gay be a a Christian? David, can someone who supports this or that political affiliation, can can they be a Christian? David, someone who is greedy or an adulterer or who is divorced, Can can they be a Christian? And here is our hope that it's actually the offer to find fulfillment that Jesus was saying words and these sinners and tax collectors would draw near to hear the offer of fulfillment and significance in Jesus' name. And it was those that were making rules and hedges and actually making enemies That were the ones that were opposed to this message of Jesus. So what's that actually look like? We recognize the challenges that exist all around us. That it feels like sometimes I can't even have a conversation without being perceived as hateful. How do I enter into this world and love my enemies? Love those that would perceive me as being hateful towards them. How do I even enter into that? I recognize the challenges that exist around me. And, and, and I also recognize 
who I once was, whether that was a rule follower that was finding identity in that, or whether I was more on the side of self-discovery, finding my significance in progressive, being progressive and, and, and doing things my way. Jesus' offer to all sinners is finding our significance and our satisfaction in him. And then we live and go as spirit-filled missionaries Monday to Saturday, happily making and developing friendships with sinners. So here's my hope. Here's the practical component of what I think living in this tension might get expressed as. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Here's what it feels like. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and Jesus receives and eats with sinners. It feels like we have some natural inclinations when it comes to the circumstances we find ourselves in. Some of us might stand up and say, David, I just want to fight. I just want to fight the aggression that seems to be coming at me. These people are my enemies, and I just want to fight them. That's not what Jesus means when he says, love your enemies. For some of us, we might find ourselves in our culture, and we just feel like we're curling up at a ball, and we just want to flee. We just want to be done with it. We just don't want to think about it. There's this mounting uh, animosity and hurt and we just don't want to deal with it. Just let me be content to be in my home. I'll close the garage door on my way in. And we just want to flee from the culture. And then it feels like there's another category where we just accept it. We just lean in and say, you know what? I know I don't share their perspective, but you know what? I actually want to affirm that. I'm just going to accept it. I'm not fleeing. I'm not fighting. I'm just... I'm actually just going to accept it, and, and if, if, if that's what they, they want to live their life, then I'm just, I'm just going to accept and, and, uh, and, and allow and, and affirm. And, uh, and yet it feels like Jesus is offering something else. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he, comes, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. That it wasn't a fight, it wasn't a flea, and it wasn't a, a sense of acceptance. It was actually pursuing the one that was lost in finding their significance in Jesus. Not in moral conformity, not in self-discovery, but rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. That as we live in this tension of standing for God's glory, and actively pursuing those in love that, that are opposed to this message from Jesus. Here's, here's my recommendations. Here would be my encouragement for us as we live and go, what, what does it look like for us to live in this? I think first, we actually view those with this ungodly perspective accurately. Here's what I mean by that. They're not my enemy. There's actually a spiritual world at play. And here's language that's resonated with me over the years. They're actually prisoners of war that I actually have a, a sensitivity and a tenderness because my, my war isn't against flesh and blood. Jesus says, love your enemies. As they oppose you, they're not my enemy in this sense. There's actually a spiritual world at play. And then second, Sometimes it feels like I have an expectation for someone to act and live with a biblical worldview who does not share my worldview. So I want to view those more accurately. I don't want to expect people with an unbiblical worldview to live as if they have one. But I don't want to fight, flee, or accept. Instead, I want to engage others lovingly. And here's what I mean by that. 
Here's what it would look like for me. In these conversations, I want to press into conversations with people that, that don't share my view on life, that significance is ultimately found in Jesus, not in any other thing that I identify as. They'll hear me say, yeah, there's a lot of different things we could find our identity in. Don't be defensive. I, I, I don't want to engage in conversation and become suspicious. Instead, I want to seek to understand. But I also want to stand with this belief. I, I don't want to be intimidated from a different worldview. Man, I, I'm confident that when we talk about uh, the, the significance of a man named Jesus who came and lived and died, I, I don't want to be intimidated to, to be told that is an inaccurate way to view life. Instead, I, I want to I wanna lovingly not be defensive, but also not be intimidated by other perspectives. Hear me say again, I want to engage in the conversation. And I don't want to be hesitant. Sometimes it feels like I, I get tentative when, when there's circumstances uh, that feel outside of my control and, and, I, and, I, and I get hesitant on what I should share and to what degree I should share it. Uh, I want to encourage, don't be hesitant. Again, it, as, we, as we see the opportunity that exists all around us for conversations, if, if there's a conversation you think could happen, my encouragement, don't be hesitant. Don't fight, don't flee, don't accept. Don't be hesitant. But, but here's how I do hope we act as we pursue people, pursuing the one, being gentle. What does it actually look like to not be suspicious, to not be aggressive, but actually in our pursuit of not being defensive, not being intimidated, not being hesitant, what would it look like to, to be gentle in these conversations? To receive criticism and to be gentle in my response. To hear constructive ideas and be gentle in my response. And yet simultaneously, being direct. Finding, <laughs> finding language that would communicate uh, standing. Not fighting, not fleeing, not accepting, but standing. To be direct in the ideas. I want to I wanna have an accurate view of those around me. I do want to engage others lovingly. And I hope there's a winsome way to the way we communicate to the world around us. I think questions are a phenomenal way to go about doing that. That sometimes uh, we get excited to share all the stats or all the inconsistencies of someone else's position. What does it look like for us to be inquisitive and curious of other people's lives, not knowing their backgrounds, not assuming things about where they're coming from or their experiences in life just based upon a position they hold. What would it look like for us at Hillcrest to be the most loving community because we take the greatest interest in other people's stories? We actually converse more persuasively because we are so curious about where other people are coming from. Not assuming others' intent, not assuming other people's perspective but truly asking questions. I think second, back to that first one, I avoid using right and wrong language. Now hear me say, do I believe based upon this biblical worldview there are right and wrong things in this world? Yes. But in conversation with people, it, it feels less productive to use right and wrong language. That it actually is less helpful to say, I think that's wrong, with someone who doesn't actually think it's all that wrong. Because if we press into people's perspectives, there are beautiful things that are true about where a lot of people are coming from in our culture. Those that are pursuing homosexual relationships, I think are pursuing 
a desire for intimacy. I think they're pursuing it in the wrong place. But their desire for intimacy, uh, again, I think is, is misplaced. Uh, I think God's beautiful desire for Revelation 5, where every tribe, tongue, people, and nation are gathering with a bunch of people that are ultimately finding our significance in worshiping the Lamb is a beautiful thing and the beautiful display of, of God's mosaic. But to find our ultimate identity and our ethnicity, again, I, I want to continue to point people, I'm avoiding right and wrong language and instead asking questions and understanding that there's some uh, pursuit of fulfillment in their position. I mean, around here, we invest resources in men's and women's ministry. We would say there are healthy things about same gender relationships. There's some relationships that I share with some buddies that I think would be inappropriate for me to share with other females outside of my wife. We actually think there's healthy things. But when skewed or misplaced, we think it's missing God's ultimate design for what he's longing to see, namely identity and fulfillment in him. Because here's our hope. Here's what we're ultimately trying to point people to. That we want to point people to find life with Jesus one life at a time. That we look around our culture and there is a thief who longs to steal and destroy and misguide these, these good and healthy things. And he's seeking to devour and divide. And instead, we get to point people to find life with Jesus one life at a time. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed by the need that exists all over the place. Andy Stanley has a line that says, do for one what you wished you could do for many. Who's the one person this week that you think you should have a conversation with? Who's the one person you think you should share this with? Not share the link, but actually share a conversation with as an expression of loving our enemies. Who's the person in your life that appears antagonistic towards your perspective? What might it look like to begin a conversation believing that the Spirit of God is doing a work in, your, in their life and we get to go as Spirit-filled missionaries pointing people to find life with Jesus? So pray with me and pray for that one person. And then I'd like you to hear from a guy uh, around here after our worship song that was one of those lives that was pursued, that was lost and then found. So pray with me as we enter into worship and then hear from Nate. God, you're so good. I feel overwhelmed by, by, by the hurt that exists all around us, but also overwhelmed in the fact that you called me your own and you left the 99 to pursue one lost even as me. Help me never to forget the depth of my brokenness and then to live in light of this reality that you modeled what it meant to eat and receive those who didn't share the same conviction as you. May I live with that same mentality and tension without compromising the deep conviction that life and significance and identity and fulfillment is found in you. Thank you, Jesus, for your glory, we pray. Amen.
Hillcrest, uh, just just continuing this conversation of hearing from our people and what God's doing in their lives. And this is Nate Vanderloop. So, Nate, Nate, why don't you just tell us a, a little bit of who you are and uh, and just what life in COVID has been like? Yeah, it's been a journey, that's for sure. Um, Nate, I am single dad here at Hillcrest. Three kids, sell granite countertops on the side. I ultimately came to the church with very little knowledge of what's going on here and and it's been a journey that i have been pursuing ever since so so uh why don't you tell us a little bit about that luke 15 talks about the 99 being left and jesus pursues the one uh what, what's that look like in your life well for me i think it's a little more unique i actually cold called the office as, mm. as is in my nature and felt a pull towards something greater that I didn't quite know what it was at the time, but ultimately felt a connection here with Hillcrest and have plugged into a number of different groups, handful of different one-on-ones over the last couple of years and just I'm still hungry for more. I, I want to know more about what's mm. going on here. So as you were exploring Jesus in those early conversations, give us a window into what some of those conversations look like. Were they antagonistic or, or were you actually received with some type of love? Uh, lots of love. I, I think that's actually maybe what kept me coming here was there mm. was no pressure. It was, it, it was almost like this carrot dangling on a string that I had to keep walking towards mm. like I, I need to know more about this because me doing it on my own just wasn't working mm. I, I i knew there was something more that i could be doing and this it still feels right mm. Mm. and then fast forward uh there was a point where you said this jesus guy is better than everything else and put your faith in him yep i i remember it clearly i wrote it down in the Bible that Hillcrest provided. Mm. It, it, it's a date stamped in my mind forever. I just, I had enough of doing it my own way. This, mm. this is, I, I, I want to do it the way the Bible talks about it, as best I can. Mm. So, so here's our conviction. Uh, Nate's story, a little unique in this sense, where he actually cold called the office and there's the salesman in him so if that gives you a small <laughs> window into who nate is the type of man he is but nate pursued and explored faith by pursuing hillcrest and we go man hallelujah praise jesus that that is the case 
But what we saw in the text today, Luke 15, Jesus actually leaves the 99 to pursue the one. Here's my hope. Here's what I hope Hillcrest is. Uh, that from the health of our community, we actually are so overwhelmed with the love of Jesus. We actually, and now Nate is part of this, pursues those in our community with this love of Jesus. That we actually go out from our community and we are Hillcrest in the neighborhood and we help people find life with Jesus one life at a time. The thief, like in Nate's story, was coming to steal and destroy. There were different challenges and circumstances that Nate didn't elaborate on. If you know Nate's story, we could maybe pick those up at another time. But Jesus offers life in his name. And so Hillcrest this week, Monday to Saturday, may we be a little bit more active in the pursuit of those in our community. Not for everyone. We can't do for everyone. But do for one what we wished we could do for everyone. That we want to help people find life with Jesus this week, Monday to Saturday. Have a great week and we will see you next Sunday. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, yeah. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, yeah. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free